my favorite thing about working in healthcare is the people. This industry brings together brilliant, highly motivated individuals who are driven by the opportunity to make a difference. My name is Hallie Tecco, and this is The Heart of Healthcare, a podcast where I'll be introducing you to the people on the ground moving the needle in public health and medicine. My name is LaShira Nolan, but my friends call me Lash. I'm from Los Angeles, California. And today I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for ordering my steps and allowing me to be here today. And for the beautiful people that they have surrounded me with in order to inspire this journey. I want to thank all my mentors at Loyola Marymount University and my friends who are watching right now. Hey, y'all. I also want to thank my Auntie Africa, who is here today, who quite literally is the reason why I decided to come to Harvard Medical School. I want to thank my little brother, who showed me how to do the Orange Ranger and keeps me on all of the Fortnite dances. (laughs) And I especially want to dedicate this day to my mother, Ty Harps, who raised me as a single mother in Compton, California, and had me at the age of 18 years old. Technically speaking, I'm not supposed to be here. Statistically speaking, speaking, this is a miracle. And mommy, you so silently are the architect behind all of my dreams and the dreams of so many in our family. And I just want you to know that you were the first superhero that I ever came to know. And I want you to know that I have this privilege of putting on this white coat and feeling like a superhero every day because of you. So I want you to know that this is your white coat and I thank you for giving me the privilege to even wear it. And lastly, to all the little black girls out there, you can't be what you can't see, but I hope you see me now and I hope you see yourself in me. We have to keep pushing, and you need to be here because medicine will not progress without us. The marathon continues. Thank you. Today on the show, I'm talking to someone who represents the future of healthcare. LaShira Nolan, known as Lash, is a Fulbright scholar and student at Harvard Medical School, where she serves as the first Black woman class president. As the founder of We Got Us, She is helping empower Black community members with accurate science information and public health resources. She is also a vocal activist, having built a platform and social following through her speaking and writing about healthcare inequality. Lash was born and raised in Compton, California, to a single mother. She told Teen Vogue, Compton made me scrappy. I'm hungry for opportunity. I'm hungry for justice. I'm hungry to see my people win. So when you put someone like me at a place like HMS, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make that vision a reality. Lash, it's so great to speak with you today. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Tell us about life as a medical student. Is it what you expected? Yeah, I mean, I think life as a medical student is a mix of a little bit of everything. I think during medical school, I've been able to maintain all the things that kept me driven and and committed to my community as an undergraduate student and growing up. And I think that that's the thing that I didn't expect. I felt like in med school, I just wouldn't have time for anything. I've been very pleasantly surprised by how I've been able to uh, maintain friendships and relationships and passions um, during my time in medical school. So I think that that's something that uh, really was a pleasant surprise coming into my first and second years of medical school. That's great. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if every medical student would say that. Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I I one hundred percent can imagine um, most folks saying no. It's a struggle, and yeah. it definitely it definitely is a grind. Um, but I think that it's one of those things where you just prepare yourself for the worst that you get here, and you're like, oh okay, if I just maneuver some things around, maybe I can make it through. <laughs> yeah. Well, on a on a kind of somber note, you know, the Mayo Clinic and Stanford study found that U.S. medical students are two to five times more likely to have clinically significant depression than similarly aged peers. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that and why there's such a culture of self-sacrifice over self-care for medical students and residents. Yeah, well, honestly, I think it's it's a part of the culture of medicine. It's something that I actually was just reflecting on with my partner. And we were just talking about how even during the pandemic, 
we saw so many health professionals really just be disregarded and in, in how they weren't given PPE, um, but they were praised as essential workers, but really weren't getting the support that they needed at the start of the pandemic. And just generally how there's this culture where the harder you work, the less you see your family, the more you sacrifice, the more you're lauded. And how it's almost a badge of honor to say, I've worked over the weekends and I haven't seen mm-hmm. my family in however many days. And that's really just a part of the culture. It sounds like Wall Street. Yeah, <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally, right? Yeah. Well, the Wall Street of medicine. <laughs> and I think that that very much so starts as a part of our pre-med culture as well. Um, you have folks who are spending all nighters trying to get A's in organic chemistry and these courses that they need in order to get into medical school. Um, and it just goes on from there because I think in medicine, it's it's built in a way where it's very hierarchical. So you're always trying to get to the next step. First is getting into medical school, then it's getting into residency, then it's getting into fellowship, then it's becoming that attending and then it's becoming, you know, that the next step in your professorship, depending if you want to do academic medicine, of course. But I think that when you have this stepwise process, it makes you kind of um, forget about the fact that there's life outside of that. And I think that that's why it's been so important to me to maintain friendships and relationships outside of medicine so that I remember that the aspects of what we go through isn't necessarily normal. (laughs) And to just remind me that there is life outside of that. And it's funny because my grandma, um, I'm I'm a first generation medical student and my grandma is like, wait, so you're not getting paid to work right now? And I'm like, no, I'm paying them to work (laughs) right now. (laughs) So it's just really interesting to to, to talk to family and friends about our training. But I think, I think that's a huge part of it, you know, and in each step you're kind of taught to sacrifice your health and wellness um, as a means to continue to progress career-wise. And I think that it's incentivized in that way. Do you think that's changing? I think I think it's changing in the fact that now, if you're not talking about wellness, then your residency program isn't as attractive to folk. I think that that's a, a, a huge part of the recruitment process. Like, you know, uh. what is your wellness process um, for residents or in your program? How do you value that? Um, but I do fear that a lot of it is superficial in the fact that, yes, you know, we have these sessions for reflection for our residents, our trainees, or even as medical students. Yes, like, you know, we have the club for for wellness, but we're still going to push students to answer a patient's message on a holiday um, in order to, because that's how you provide the best level of care is mm-hmm. when you're always there for your patient. I think that sometimes when we, when we, have these wellness conversations or spaces, sometimes what people really want are like, you know, good, healthy snacks in the resident room all the time Mm -hmm. and a day off. Like they rather have that hour off to just reflect and take a nap or call family or do something else. And I think that sometimes we're so focused on filling that wellness space with something to say we're doing something that we don't realize that we're just adding more requirements onto people's plates. Yeah. Well, as a patient, I'd much rather have someone looking after me who who's yeah. well rested and right. feeling good. I don't want someone who's at the end of a 24 hour shift and just, you know, not feeling great. Right. Exactly. Give, give them their snacks, give them their yeah. naps. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. So in your um, New England Journal of Medicine article, which congrats, by the way, um, Thank you. you shared stories about incidents in your medical education, like the CPR training or learning how to diagnose Lyme disease, where the curriculum just completely missed the mark. Can you tell us about these cases? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that piece was actually the first piece that I've ever written um, to be published anywhere. And it really came out of this natural desire to share this uh, this experience that I had during my first year of medical school. And at this point, I was maybe three months into school and we were in microbiology class learning about Borrelia burgdorferi, the spirochete that causes Lyme disease. And 
we were learning about the, the ways that Lyme disease progresses and how in stage one of Lyme disease, patients can present with a rash called erythema migrans or um, more traditionally known as the bullseye rash. And the professor had an image of erythema migrans on the screen and it was on a patient with white skin. And my classmate, who is a black man, raised his hand and said, hey, how would I recognize that rash in a patient that had skin tone similar to mine or a family member who had the same situation? And the professor really didn't know how to give him an adequate answer. He just said, well, you know, it, it appears a little bit more purple on darker skin, um, but honestly, it's hard to see. And you can't really use this as the, your sole piece of information for diagnosis anyways, and just kind of kept on going with the conversation. So I was like, that's a really interesting point that it brings up because because I was also curious about the same thing. So I uh, went on my phone and just Googled uh, bullseye rash. And literally, I was just looking through pages and pages on the images section of Google Images and literally could not find an image of how this presented on darker skin. And even though I knew that not every patient presents with the bullseye rash, I was concerned because I felt that this was representative of how we're taught to recognize key clinical findings as physicians in training only on white skin and how that in itself was a reflection of racism and white supremacy. If we're learning to only recognize disease in one group Mm -hmm. and we're completely just leaving out this other group that's been traditionally marginalized in our society. So I decided to write this piece and in, you know, telling the story that I just told you about, I learned that there was a study that showed that Black patients tend to receive later diagnosis of Lyme disease. And the authors believe that it was partly because the erythema migrans rash is not typically seen or recognized at its earlier stages. And that has serious implications because we know that Lyme disease can lead to um, issues with the heart. We know it can lead to Bell's palsy and affect the neurological system. And it has this sequelae that can be very disturbing. And um, I think that the fact that we're not learning to catch that, partly because of how we're being taught, it it, it shows that, that there's a systemic issue in how we're being taught medicine. And it has serious implications for the, the types of physicians that we're graduating. And I think the other case that I bring up is how women are less likely to receive bystander intervention for CPR. And the reason why I brought that example up is because when we were learning how to do CPR, something that all medical students have to learn, we were only learning on male body mannequins. So that means that, you know, patients with breasts were not as comfortable with learning to maneuver around that extra tissue that the patient has or having that conversation about consent after doing CPR or before, or what does that even look like? And I think that those are the discomforts that are leading to this disproportionate number of women who aren't receiving that care that they need. So I think that once again, it just brought up systemic issues in medical training that really needs to be addressed if we're going to be able to graduate and provide the best level of care for all patients. And did you bring this up with the administration or your professors? I did. I did. Um, Especially with the the Lyme disease um, piece. I mean, something about me is like, I'm, I'm someone who's going to call out the system, but I'm always going to tell you that I'm going to call you out. Right. So I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, publish like a tell all yeah. and you're not going to know that I'm telling it all. I'm going to give you the chance to, to do better. And then together we're going to work to, to address the issue. So I actually approached that professor and I said, Hey, I got to say, you know, the way that we handled this situation in class yesterday didn't really feel completely resolved. And I had a conversation with that professor and he said, you know, I completely agree and I support you in writing this up because I do think that it's a systemic issue. And the next day he came to class and we really had like a five minute conversation about disparities and and how he felt like the way that the situation was handled um, wasn't adequate. And it was really fruitful. But I think the issue is that it was only a five minute conversation that Mm -hmm. was had because a student 
of the marginalized group raised his hand and said, hey, how would I support my community with the information and the education I'm being given here? And I think that that's, it brings up a lot of issues. Number one, these conversations can't just be a five minute add on. And two, it can't be the marginalized group that is advocating for themselves in these spaces. It needs to be a we that's saying, hey, why aren't we learning how to recognize this in all patients? Because those are going to be my patients. Yeah. Yeah. Like let's, let's self-reflect and correct from decades of systemic racism in medical education and care. Yeah. 100%. And on on that note, research does show that diversifying the physician workforce can help reduce health disparities, yet the percentage of students from these groups in medicine is increasing at a really paltry rate. And I actually read that it has decreased for Black men since 1978. Yeah. So what needs to happen to, to reach parity for Black and Hispanic doctors in the U.S.? Oh, my goodness. I mean... (sighs) I big think, question, but yeah. yeah. No, it's a big question, um, but I'm so glad you asked it. I mean, I think the the first thing that needs to happen is we need to look way down the pipeline. Um, and I'm talking just looking at our education system and reflecting on the way it's set up and thinking about who has access to quality education in STEM. And for example, there are students who don't even have the resources that they need for their chemistry classes, who clearly don't have the same um, advanced placement um, accessibility within their courses. Um, And all of those things are reflection of systemic racism and the way that redlining impacts the way that taxes are paid and which schools get a certain amount of support. And when we think about the public school system versus the private school system and the charter schools, I mean, it's all really wrapped up in all of those things. Um, But I think that just being a medical student and getting to this stage as a first generation student from Compton, California, um, I was raised in one of those communities where we didn't have a lot of resources, but I was blessed to go to magnet and gifted public school programs where a lot of resources were poured into me. But when we consider the, the path that it takes to get to medical school, this profession is really one of the wealthy. It's, I mean, when you look at who is largely represented in, in medical school classes, um, there's been studies by the AAMC and reports by them that have shown that a lot of these folks are among the, the most wealthy of our society. And in order to, for example, if you think about just applying to medical school, first you have to um, become a pre-medical student at a university. So if you're first gen, um, you're not coming into the situation with much um, generational wealth, you have to go um, and, and spend this money, you know, if you don't get that scholarship uh, to get your undergraduate education. Um, and a lot of these students are also doing work study a lot of them are working while they're in school. So it's this added pressure because you have to do the the volunteering, doing the clubs, and also excelling your courses while also funding your education. And then after that, it's time to take the MCAT. And you then have to fork out this money for an MCAT prep course. And you're talking in the thousands. Wow. Wow. (laughs) Right? You know, so you're thinking, okay, like it's a really be competitive you then have to think about applying for these courses. Or if you don't do that, then buying the books and then thinking about the time that it takes to study for the MCAT. So you're coming out, you know, and this is if you decide to take a gap year or whatever the case is, you know, I took two gap years. So you have folks who are taking time to study for the MCAT, but they also have to work. They also have to find, in order to study for the MCAT, there's a level of privilege that you have to have to put that time aside to really put into studying. Um, And then you have to pay for the MCAT, right? Which can, you know, cost you another three, four hundred dollars. And then after you take the MCAT, then you have to apply to medical school, which for each school can run you um, over one hundred dollars. And then once you get into those schools, you have to go and you have to interview. You have to buy a suit. You have to buy shoes. And and this is all to make sure that you maintain this level of quote unquote professionalism when you go 
for these experiences. And then once you get into medical school, I thought the costs were done once I finally got into medical school, right? But <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> I was totally wrong. I was like, this is just the beginning, right? Um, yeah. You know, you get to medical school and even at Harvard, you know, there's all, we're all using the same resources, right? Like we're all using, you know, sketchy micro to help us with microbiology. We're all using UWorld for question banks to help us study for our shelf exams. And then we're also using AMBOSS. I mean, there's all of these hidden costs, pathoma, you know, these are all words that I didn't know anything about, but there are these extra resources that's kind of expected for students to buy as a way to help them succeed on the standardized tests that we take. And then you have to pay for the tests. <laughs> so yeah. it's it's extremely expensive. And I think that even if you think about clinical rotations, um, a lot of folks will say, yeah, like my, my site was, you know, 45 minutes or an hour away from school. So you're thinking about Ubers, you're thinking about cars, who has access to those things? And there's just a lot of hidden fees and costs associated with a career in medicine. And it's a forever thing. It's something that goes on. And there's this assumption that, oh, well, you're going to be fine because you're going to be a doctor. Yeah. But you have to think about Who's coming in with intergenerational wealth? And if you think about the history of slavery, the, the genocide of indigenous peoples, um, you think about the struggles that our Latinx community has in our country, there are going to be marginalized people who are fixing the, the wrongdoings of our society by making sure that their family stays afloat, where they're not going to be able to have access to extra income after they become a physician to just simply pay off their loans as other communities have. Yeah. And how many years does it take you to pay off that debt? A decade at least. Right. So you're exactly. putting off, yeah, I mean, right. in, in choosing careers, uh, you know, if you're going to be putting off income for 10 years versus graduating college and, you know, doing another profession that you can earn income immediately if you're supporting family members, it, that trade-off, I can't, I can't imagine being faced with that. Yeah, 100%. So you wrote uh, another article. I love reading uh, what you write because it's so insightful. So your article for the Boston Globe was titled, Why Doesn't Medical School Prioritize Social Justice? Yeah. So on, on this note, so not just ensuring that students have an equitable chance of getting in, but an equitable chance of succeeding in medical school. Um Tell, tell us all about how medical schools don't prioritize social justice and why. Yeah. So so that piece um, was one that I wrote after having a conversation with a mentor. And as amazing mentors do, they help you get your CV together. And we were going through the process of getting your CV prepared for in, in the format of someone who's interested in academic medicine, right? So there's like a specific format for CVs for different careers. And I was like, okay, I was learning the, the ropes for, for academic medicine. And we were going through the various sections, you know, you have your publications, you have your um, speeches and things that you give and, and lectures. And we kind of just brushed through the community service section, you know, they were just like, okay, well, you know, this section really isn't as important, unfortunately. So let's like keep on moving down to the publication section. So here, and we kind of went into this deep conversation about the various sections that mattered and how you really need to beef up those sections. And I was like, it's just so interesting to me that we're brushing over this community service piece because I believe that's the reason why I even got into medicine in the first place. And I started to reflect on the process of getting tenure in academic medicine. And I started to reflect on the types of research projects that are funded by the NIH. And the answer to those reflections was overwhelmingly that our system does not incentivize people who are dedicated to social justice. And I think the examples that I thought of when it came to getting tenure is that really what is valued is your output. How much are you producing in regards to your research? But it doesn't, that, that type of system doesn't really 
give much to the community. Because for example, if I'm a disparities researcher and I realize that having conversations about hypertension or doing hypertension screening in, in Black barbershops is what leads to improved outcomes, I'm not incentivized in this system to then apply for a grant to apply those findings that I found in my research to the community and to spend that time really in community building out this blood pressure um, and prevention program in Black barbershops, because I already have to be thinking about, okay, what's the next thing that I'm going to write about? What's the next disparity that I'm going to elucidate? And I think that it really puts a lot of pressure on on community-based researchers, because in this system, it's really like quantity over quality. And in a system that just incentivizes output, this this publish and perish mentality, who really benefits and who really suffers, right? Because, you know, I, I wrote this piece in, in the New England Journal of Medicine, which I hope will have some level of impact on medicine by who will read it. But my community members, my family, my grandma, they don't have access to Nijum. So when we publish these pieces, it's like, who is reading them and who are they for? Is it really for us to serve ourselves and moving forward in our careers? Or is it so that we can create that research, which is important and imperative, but how do we translate it to community work without it negatively impacting our ability to move forward as professors, as scholars, in a way that is meaningful for ourselves and our students. And I think the the second example that I brought up is how you have a lot of Black professors at academic medicine institutions who are really doing a lot to mentor marginalized folks at these institutions. So for example, when I think about Harvard Medical School, we have, you know, they, they, we, we tout that we have so many faculty, like over 10,000 faculty, right? But of those 10,000 faculty, how many of them are Black women? And that's going to be a mentor that I'm really going to need in my circle because they're going to help me navigate this space, especially as a first gen medical student. But then they're not paid for that, are they? They're not paid for that. Exactly. Right. And there's only so many of them. So they have this this publish or perish mentality that they have to learn to conquer. Right. But then they also have to mentor me. And oh, they're also going to serve on your anti-racism task force that you've requested for them to be on with no extra pay, with no extra way to, to compensate them for the time that they're spending. It's like, okay, if you're going to ask your your URM faculty to mentor all your URM students to serve on your committees, and you're not going to incentivize their research, but then when it comes to promotion, you're going to say, oh, I'm sorry, your output isn't enough. It's really just a system of gaslighting. We'll be right back after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. So kind of changing gears, in terms of you being in medical school and kind of getting to know your peers, do you think that your generation of doctors are going to approach medicine differently and change the system? I have so much hope for this next generation of physicians. Like, Awesome. That's great to hear. Yes, I, I really do. I really do. Um, I think that what's exciting is that it's not just in medicine. Like when I think about friends and colleagues that I have um, in divinity school and public health school um, and law school and business school. There are folks 
who are really thinking about how do we make a more equitable system? And I think that the the generation of like millennials, or I think they're gen, I, I, for, I get confused with, you know, all of these different names that they give the groups. But I think that the generation that's younger than me, they're even more social justice minded. And Gen I feel Z, like, Gen Z, right? You're, Gen are Z, you, there we go. You're yes. pro- I'm, I, I'm an old millennial. You're probably a young millennial. And then that, they're Gen yeah. Z. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I always, I feel like there's so many different parameters. I'm like, yeah. this, someone can write a dissertation on this, yeah. you know? <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I really am inspired. And I think that the reason why I think I'm feeling hopeful is that I see my peers educating the old guard. So yeah. when they're, when they're on their rotations, they're like, look, Every patient that I speak to, I'm going to introduce myself with my pronouns. And I don't know if that's what you do, but that's that's what I'm going to do. I don't care what age the patient is, how they look. Yeah. If that's what I'm going to do. And I think that by being unforgivably dedicated to social justice, yeah. that is the way that 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 this generation of future physicians is, is really going to change the game. But I think that that change can go only as far as the system is willing to be malleable. Yeah. So if we are going to continue to train physicians in a system that is systemically racist, a system that is systemically making our students and trainees depressed, then you can come into this career, into this system with all the hope and desire to make a change in the world. But if you don't give folks the space to really thrive and be joyous because of this system, then you're going to sap it out of them. And by the time they become that attending, they're going to be so jaded and they're going to be in this system of let me publish or perish. And that's why we need systemic change. So it can't just be an individual imperative. It has to be a collective one. So on that note, if you could wave a magic wand and completely remake medical education in the U.S., what would that look like? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, I think, you know, one one thing that I would hope to do is off the bat, I don't think that any student should be doing the work of, of medicine and healing without knowing their community. So I think that the first step of of training would need to be meeting with community leaders, um, learning about where people go to eat, where they go to fellowship, where they go to feel safe, where they go to play, really learning about what the lives are of the folks that they're going to be serving, because that's going to directly influence how your patient is going to be able to take their insulin, how they're going to be able to manage their hypertension or their diabetes. If you're saying, hey, you know, I need you to take this metformin, but at the same time, you don't even realize the access to healthy food or the access to safe spaces to exercise, then you're going to be unable to fully be the healer that you need to be for that patient. And I think that that's where a lot of us are failing in that, you know, we come to these communities and we work, but then we leave. We're not eating lunch in the community. We're not, um, you know, going to the gym in the community. We're doing all of that elsewhere. And then we're coming in. So I think that really learning about the systemic struggles of community members and and learning that they really are the folks that we have so much to learn from um, as a way to become better healers. I think that that would be the first thing that I want to do. And I think that some schools have versions of it. I know we do that for like a day here at Harvard Medical School, but I think that that needs to be a longer immersion. And I think it needs to be a continuous immersion. And I think that more and more really community leaders and activists and advocates should be our professors. And I think um, if we can move in that kind of a direction, that'd be awesome. And I think the second thing I do is is making sure that conversations about disparities aren't these slides at the end of a, you know, a 45 minute lecture and you spend two minutes on this slide saying, hey, yeah, so today we talked about diabetes. And as you can see, you have a black Latinx and indigenous peoples who have disproportionate rates of diabetes. um, And we're doing everything we can to to really address this. And it's really sad. And that's the end of the lecture, right? Yeah. (laughs) And I feel like that's that's the reality right now. And it's like, no, let's have an entire conversation about this. Let's discuss it in small groups. And it's okay. I think we always end on this question of like, you know, 
what do we have to be hopeful about? And it's okay to not be hopeful about it, but to really do the work to make sure that we address the issue. Um, because right now, we, we aren't hopeful. And I think that that's okay. I think that there's always this like, you know, nice bow that we want to put on difficult conversations, but no, what do yeah. we need to do to get there? And I think that that's something that I like to change. And I think lastly, it would be the conversation that, that we just had where we think about incentivizing social justice. So how do we build a system where our medical students and our residents and um, even our attendings are really push to do the work of social justice in a genuine way. Um, and, and they really are able to become that researcher, professor, um, and leader that they want to be without feeling like they have to sacrifice or lose something in, in their journey to, to get there. Yeah. Um, so we can, we can go on for days, but I think they're really <laughs> centering community and love um, and, and allowing us to be whole people in our training is really what I would hope to, to create. It actually sounds a lot like the public health curriculum. So I just, mm. at age 37, finished my MPH and about a third of my colleagues were practicing physicians well into their careers who yeah. a lot of them told me that's really why they wanted to get their MPH, to be able to yeah. look more holistically at cases with their patients and understand the social determinants of health. And so it feels like perhaps there's some more public health curriculum that could be embedded into the medical school curriculum. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think yeah. that public health schools have always been on it. I think that, you know, that that view, that upstream yeah. understanding of medical problems is the way to go. And I think specifically with an anti-racist lens, I think that all these things we really have to consider, OK, what are the underpinnings of our country and what are ways that sociopolitical decisions, policies, and intentional things have led to these outcomes. And I think that that's where even public health schools can do better, right? Because a lot of times we talk about these are social determinants of health and these are kind of, you know, disparities, but really thinking about how these things aren't natural and they weren't just kind of created and just appeared magically, but really they were purposeful systems that have led to the things that we're seeing. Yeah. Throughout someone's entire life. I mean, the life yeah. course perspective is really interesting. So when did you know you were going to be a doctor? Is this something that very early on you knew or high school? Yeah. I mean, for me, it was actually like, third grade. I, that's wow. like the, the first time I remember like speaking the words like, yes, I'm going to become a doctor. And I remember like my love for science really came through after I won the third grade science fair at Ambler Elementary School um, in LA. And I like told my mom the day before that I had this science experiment to do for the, for this uh this fair. And she was like, what? So we went and we like Googled some project and we ended up like looking at the behavior of fish and how they respond to darkness or something like that. And uh, it ended up That's winning fun. and it was just, it was, yeah, it was really fun. It was cool. I was like, oh, this is neurology. I was like, I'm going to become a neurosurgeon. And that's what I would tell people. I was like, yeah, I'm going to become a neurosurgeon. That was like my thing. Um, and I'm still fascinated by the brain, but no longer want to be a surgeon. Uh, but I think that that moment was very much so emblematic of how my mom has always just supported me and guided me without question. You know, she was like, OK, yeah. we're going to do it. Um, and she really is, you know, the the engine behind me and everything that I've been able to accomplish. And um, I say that I'm so proud of her all the time because <sighs> she's the reason why. I'm even here, you know? Yeah. So I'm like, if you're proud of me, then you got to be proud of my mama because I, I wouldn't be here without her. Yeah. I want to, um, your, your white coat speech had me tearing up when you oh, called her out. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's really beautiful. So, uh, you know, have you ever had moments where you really were close to giving up and uh, other than your mother or maybe only your mother, what really kept you going? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, the most challenging moments of, my journey to becoming a physician was really in, in undergraduate and the undergraduate portion when I was in college because being pre-med is a grind, you know? I feel like at every step, like there's someone who's trying to weed you out. There's always someone who's telling you, oh, well, 
I don't know if this is right for you. You know, I had so many different uh, professors and people kind of tell me like, are you sure this is the track for you? And I was a health and human sciences major at my school. And that's like where um, you learn a lot about public health and you learn a lot about like human anatomy, physiology, but it wasn't considered like a hard science major, like a biology or a biochemistry. So in that sense, you know, I felt like there was a lot of, you know, um, unspoken discouragement of folks from where I was coming from to, to go into to medicine. And I think also just adjusting to the fact that, you know, where I went to school, I didn't necessarily, you know, take like AP physics. And I think that there were, there were people who kind of came into college from different prep schools and they kind of had access to resources where it was easy for them to kind of just jump into it. But I think that I had a lot to kind of learn and get used to. And, you know, I definitely had moments where I was like, yo, is this the path for me? Is this is this really what I want to do? I really thought, like, should I just do public health? Because I felt like, you know, as I was learning in school, like that was more where my passions lie. But I was like, no, I really need to become a physician because I felt that that mindset that I had, that public health mindset needed to infiltrate medicine because those are the folks who are having the direct day-to-day relationships and conversations with patients. So absolutely. I, I mean, I say it all the time. I mean, I was the, studying for the MCAT was brutal. I feel like that was the most sad I ever was. I just wake up and just, just study and yeah. just look at this book <laughs> all day. And I was like, oh my goodness. So that was rough. Um, you know, I got an F on like my first chemistry exam, um, but I'm still here, y'all. You know, I got a B <laughs> On my, you know, I got a B on my on my report card at one point, uh, but still made it to Harvard <laughs> Medical School. So I, this is all to say, yeah. like, you know, when you have this idea of like, you know, what you have to do as a pre medical student, you're like, I have to do these one thousand hours of community service or you know, direct clinical care. That's another point I, I failed to bring up is that you know, there's these requirements that you have of getting exposure to um, to medicine, right? And thinking about who has access to like that position in their family, who can give them those hours that they need. But it was really hard yeah. at first to like find people that would let me shadow them. Like I would have to just like cold email people like, hey, would you let me join you in your office? And I didn't always get a response. I think a lot of folks don't get a response. And now being a medical student and seeing how busy my preceptors are, I'm like, I see why I wasn't getting a response, right? Like, you know, I think that, and and it goes back to the extra burden put on URN faculty and, and health providers because they feel this natural desire to want to serve and to help their community by allowing that student to shadow them. But it's like, it's hard to, to do that yeah. uh, for so many students. So all this to, to, to say, like, you know, it's, it's a journey and it's a tough one. But I think that during the entire process, I always kept in mind the person I was becoming and the person that I wanted to be. And I never let the challenges get me down because number one, I knew why I was doing it. And I knew that I was raised by the strongest woman I've ever met in my life. And I knew how hard she was grinding, how hard she worked for me to be here. So how can I give up when my mom raised me as a single parent in Compton, California, and managed to get both her bachelor's and master's degree and continues to push herself every single day to be better and to strive greater for her family. So I think, I think really, you know, she's my, my engine, but I think also my journey to get here wasn't smooth. It wasn't, you know, just a straight mm-hmm. shot. Yeah. So when I encounter challenges in medical school, whatever it may be, you know, a hard day, you know, feeling like I'm incompetent because of whatever, you know, just, just being a med student, you just push through and you get up and you just do it again because you know you're doing it for your community. Yeah. That's beautiful. I hope that we have some future med students that are listening. Um, yeah, it's it's very cool to hear the the truth about it that it isn't always an easy path. But here you are, and you're making a difference beyond just the work that you're doing at school. You also have a nonprofit that you started that you're running. I can't imagine how you have time for that on top of all the articles and using your platform for social justice. So you know that's awesome. Can you tell us about We Got Us, your nonprofit? Absolutely. So We Got Us was was started 
because in December, when the vaccines were first approved, uh, I was getting a lot of messages from family members and friends asking about the vaccines. They were just like, look, what's up with this? And I think, you know, naturally being the first in your family to do this, yeah. you really become like the doctor. And wait, sorry, <laughs> they were they were skeptical about should they get the vaccine or not? Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. Yeah. They, they were just they were just wondering about it. You know, I felt yeah. like every, like everybody was. They were just like, okay, we were. It's, it's like we were all waiting for the vaccine to come, but then when yeah. it finally came, we were like, but wait, it's here. Oosh, do I want, really want to be one of the early ones? Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. right, right, exactly. So, so naturally, a lot of my family and friends were coming to me asking me about it and if I felt like it was safe. And um, I was doing a lot of explaining about the science behind it, and you know, as I was doing my own research and. At the same time that I was doing that work, there was a lot of reports coming out in the media about this idea of skepticism within the Black community about the vaccine. And they were really citing these historical instances of medical racism as a reason for that. So they were talking about um, the untreated syphilis experiment. They were talking about Henrietta Lacks. Uh, They were talking about, um, you know, Betsy and Narcha and, and, and the enslaved women that Marion Sims operated on and that experience, but they weren't really focusing on the day-to-day experiences of medical racism that my community faces. And they also weren't talking about access. They weren't talking about how once we got these vaccines, how are we going to make sure that communities have access to it, access to the education that they need to understand why this vaccine is safe and physical access to the vaccine, um, access to physicians who look like them, um, who can explain information about it. And the other piece of it was related to that last point. There were studies that were also coming out showing that racial ethnic concordance between provider and patient led to increased seeking of information about the vaccine. So that means if you put a Black provider in front of a Black patient, that Black patient was more likely to want to get more information about the vaccine and to feel more comfortable in doing so because that physician looked like them. Yeah. And because of the paucity of physicians that we have in our country who are Black people because of systemic racism and the challenges of entering the career and the Flexner Report and so many other things, this is the situation that we were in. So I knew that there was a need for an organization that would, number one, have an understanding of medical racism in a historical sense, not just focusing on these events that happened years and, and decades ago, but really the way it presents today. And then also making sure that we connect providers who look like the patients and communities that they're trying to impact and give information to, and also increasing access to the vaccine by doing the door knocking and the canvassing that was necessary to get that information out there. So I literally, um, it was Christmas break. Um, I'm like, Lash, you have no time to do this. Like you're literally in your clinical year. You are a full medical student right now. Um, But the more I thought about it, I I literally sat on the idea for about a week or two. And I was like, if I don't do this, who's going to do it? And I was like, okay. So I just wrote this little proposal, um, started sending emails to folks and um, stumbled upon a a great support within the American Board of Internal Medicine. And he was like, okay, Lash, I'm going to give you $10,000 to start this. I was like, okay. So I just went, you know, I sent out a call for applications to different Black medical students and pre-medical students across the Massachusetts area, did an informational session Um, started interviewing folks for positions. And now, you know, six months later, we're a coalition of over 100 students, um, have an executive team of eight folks, um, and each of them are committed to various aspects of our organization. And what we do um, is we empower through education. We do these things called empowerment sessions, uh, where we really spend about an hour with different community groups virtually talking about the history of medical racism, the way the vaccines work, 
and really answer any questions they have about the vaccines. And we tailor it to the needs of each group. So if you're interested in the vaccines in relation to, you know, being a pregnant person, if you're worried about the vaccine and how it relates to youth, uh, we also do youth empowerment sessions and have a team of high school students that works with us. And in addition to that, we're in the community um, and we're, we do uh, canvassing and we do various community events uh, where, you know, if you're out having a festival, we're going to be out there talking to folks about the vaccine and getting them vaccine appointments. And recently we started to do our own community events where we've had comedy shows and also have kind of combined the arts with with also public health in that way. And it's been a phenomenal opportunity. It's, it's really been really everything that I want to do. I mean, I imagine myself being a 100% community-based physician and really, you know, bridging this gap between the information and access to tools that we have. So it's been a a major blessing and I'm just really proud of how the organization is growing and um, excited to see where we go in the future. You've already impacted the lives of so many, and no doubt you'll continue to do so as you carry on your journey to become a doctor. My last question for you is how we can support your work. I would say uh, if you're interested in learning more about We Got Us, uh, you should check us out at We Got Us Project. um, And that's on Facebook, that's on Twitter, and that's on Instagram. And we're regularly posting uh, different videos. We have this awesome animated video that recently was released that really breaks down um, the vaccine and the disparities that we've seen. So if you're looking for something that is tangible that you can share with um, community groups and leaders, please check us out there um, on on all our socials. And if you just want to donate or learn more about the organization and our origins, check us out at We Got Us Project org or our website. We have all that information there. If you're interested in volunteering, collaborating, we would love that. Just please hit us up there. Um, and if you want to follow my work personally, um, you can read any and all of my articles at LashiraNolan.com. Um, I also rap as well. So you can check out some of the raps that I do there um, and, and all the other panels and things like that that I participate in. I'm on um, Instagram at Lash Nolan Official and on on Twitter at Lash Nolan. So uh, please follow me. I love to engage in conversation around all these topics of social justice. And um, I just want to thank you so much. Thank um, you. I really hope that this conversation can can impact some hearts and lives. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lash. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Heart of Healthcare podcast. If you liked today's show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. The Heart of Healthcare with Halle Tecco is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producers are Holly Tecco and Matthew Zachary. Our senior producers are Brianna Seeley and Andrew McDowell. It is mixed and edited by Brianna Seeley. Our music is by Utah. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. Hit us up at contact at offscript.com to share comments, feedback, and make recommendations. For more information, visit offscript.com. That's offscript, no T, dot com.